Our scripture this morning is in John chapter 21, starting in verse 20. And here's what John says. Uh, Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them, the one who had leaned back against him during the supper and had said, Lord, who is it that will betray you? When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So the saying spread abroad among the brothers that this disciple was not to die, yet Jesus did not say to him that he, would, that he was not to die, but if it is my will that, that he remain until I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things. And we know that his testimony is true. Now there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Well, as I said, today we conclude our, our journey through John. Um, and it's been an exciting journey. And I hope that God has challenged, er, encouraged, and stretched you um, through this study as much as he has... Uh, done that through me, and um, but the Gospel of John is is has been incredible trip, and in this Gospel, John uh, basically he's presenting Jesus a different way than maybe the other Gospels. He's presenting Jesus though as fully God and fully man, and through um, through all of uh, the the teaching of Jesus and the miracles and um, his actions through his crucifixion and resurrection, even. Um, we see Jesus as the only way, the truth, and the life, as the only way that, that we can have a relationship with God. And although John, he doesn't share as much information, again, this is the fourth gospel, so he, he adds maybe some information and, and highlights some information that the other gospels might not, but he's strate very strategic in his writing. As a matter of fact, as we started our series, we looked at John chapter 20, right? And at the end of John chapter 20, G um, John says, Hey, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that in believing or by believing you may have life in his name. And this life in his name is so much more than just eternal life. Sometimes when we read that, we say, well, yeah, he's talking about eternal life. And he just presented it all, so maybe he should end his gospel there. But John doesn't. He continues for one more chapter. And the reason he does that is because when John is talking about this life, he's talking more than just eternal life. He's also saying that, you know what, Jesus transforms our life right here and now. The way we live is affected by our belief in him and is led by Jesus right here and now. So he includes chapter 21 for an important reason, to reveal how trusting Jesus and finding life in him changes how we live right here and now. And that's what we've done in the last couple of weeks in looking at chapter 21. As a matter of fact, we found that Jesus is our provider. We don't need to worry about anything. We saw that through the first 14 verses when, with the miracle of the great, the great catch of fish, right? And then last week, we also saw how he loves us. And even though we aren't perfect, he can still use us and wants to give us purpose, as we saw with Peter. And then this morning, we discover something important, that life in him is lived with incredible focus. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. So why don't you turn to chapter 20, 21 of John as we look at it. And as you're turning, if you remember last week, just to kind of set the stage, um, Jesus is addressing Peter. Remember, the disciples and, and Jesus are all sitting on the beach. They're enjoying breakfast together. And Jesus um, talks to Peter. And three times he asks him if he loves him. And each time he asks, he follows that with a call for Peter um, to feed the sheep or feed his sheep. And it's a call to action. And then Jesus tells Peter that he's going to follow after Jesus in his death, or he's going, to, he's going to die. But even in his death, he'll glorify God. And then he kind of closes out this, this conversation with Peter the way he started his conversation with Peter when they first met. And he tells Peter, follow me. Remember, when he first called Peter, he said, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Here he closes out and says, follow me. Well, now, um, 
At some point during this conversation, Jesus and Peter get up and they begin walking off together. So it's just the two of them. And that's kind of where we open in verse 20. So they're walking alone together when Peter turns around, right? And he turns around and he sees someone following him. One of the disciples is following him. And John describes this disciple and he's obviously describing himself. So John is following close behind, um, not wanting to be too far from Jesus. And Peter asks Jesus, after he sees John, he says, well, what about this man? And what he's really asking is, Jesus, what's in store for John? You've just told me what's in store for, for me, but what do you have for John? And, and, and what will he experience? Even, how's he going to die? <laughs> Um, so he asked Jesus that. And in verse 20, 22, we see Jesus answer. So Jesus answered. He says, if it's my will to have John basically not die before I return, what is that to you, Peter? And as we read that, and we can read that and say, oh, you know, Jesus is asking this. And sometimes I think we, 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 we like to look at Jesus that he's like always just so polite all the time. And he's always kind of, sometimes we picture him, he always speaks in a British accent, right? And he's very formal and very polite. You know, sometimes Jesus goes all South Philly on people. You know what I mean? He gets blunt. And this is one of those times. And I always kind of love when Jesus does this because he cuts straight to the point with Peter. So what he says is basically, he's, he's saying, you know what, Peter, whether or not I keep John alive until I return, it shouldn't matter to you. It's none of your business what I do with John. What is your business is that you follow me. Do you get what he's saying here? Stop worrying about somebody else. Here's what you're to do. And you know, as I read that, I, I, I don't know about you, but I, I think we can all kind of be like Peter sometimes where we can sometimes get consumed what other people are doing or what they should be doing rather than ourselves and our relationship with God and what we should be doing. Have you ever been there? And in fact, you know, as, as we look at this and you say, well, shouldn't we be concerned? Don't we, aren't we all supposed to be doing the same thing? Well, there are some things that are common for all of us. There are some things that are true for each of us that do bring us together. For example, we all have the same need for salvation. Do you know that? We all share the same need for salvation. No matter who you are, whether you're old or young, whether you're rich or poor, whether you um, know a little or you know a lot, whether you've sinned once or you've sinned many times, whether you've sinned with a big sin or whether you think, maybe I barely sinned. No matter who you are, you know what the Bible says? We've all sinned. And if we sinned once, then that makes us fall short of the glory of God. Paul says that in Romans 3. And then in Romans 6, he says, so since we've all sinned, you know what that deserves? It deserves death, eternal separation from God. We can't be with God. So basically, we all need saving. So that's one thing we all have in common, and we should all be unified around and call each other for. And because we all need saving and we can't save ourselves, then we all have the same way of salvation. And this is something else we share. We all come to salvation the same way. In this, we gain salvation the same way. Whether we do a little or we do a lot, for God, whether we go to church, whether we read our Bible, whether we're from a devout family, or whether we sin horribly in our lives and never want anything to do with God, no one can be saved in and of themselves or what they do. Scripture says that, right? So then, how can we be saved? Well, we're all saved the same way. Jesus talked about it in John. In John 14, he says, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father, or no one comes to salvation, except through me. You see, we all have the same need for salvation. We're all saved the same way, which is through Jesus, through his work, 
through his sacrificial work on the cross, and through his resurrection, we have life. That's the only way. And when we trust this, we become saved, or we're called believers. And that's what John talks about throughout his gospel. And as believers, we have some similarities as well, because now we're all called, or we all have, the same calling or purpose to our lives. You know, it's very interesting because Jesus, when he calls all of the disciples, every one of his disciples that's recorded how he calls them, he all calls them the same way. You know what he does? He says, follow me. He said it to the fishermen. He said it to Nathaniel. He said it to Matthew. He said it to all of his disciples, follow me. That's a calling that Jesus gives to everyone who believes in him is to follow him. So we all have the same calling, and we all have the same purpose as well. See, in following Jesus, you know what Jesus is saying. You're to follow after me, but you're also to take on what, what I did or my mission onto yourself. And that's what he does before he leaves, and he, and he kind of talks about that and says, you know, we're to go into all the world and be his witnesses. But following achieves that same purpose, which is to reflect him and his mission. Or in, uh, in short, to proclaim him. So we're to follow and proclaim Jesus. As a matter of fact, Paul in 2 Corinthians talks about that. You know, the same passage that we always talk about, that we're a new creation in Christ, that we're believers. And then Paul says, therefore, we're ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled. Or Paul says, as believers, we're to proclaim Jesus. We're to follow him and proclaim him. And proclaim salvation and life through Jesus alone. And this is something that all believers are called to be doing. However, I want to give you a difference. And it's this. We all accomplish this calling and purpose in a unique way. We need to understand this truth as well. That even though we have the same need and the same way to salvation and the same calling or purpose to our lives, the way we accomplish it will most undoubtedly be different or unique for each of us. So how Jesus calls us to follow and proclaim him is unique because, or it's different for each of us, because of the way he made us, right? Right? Uh, Psalm 30, 139 says, you know, we've been intricately woven in our mother's womb by him. We're fearfully and wonderfully made. Do you know what that means? He makes each of us personally. And he makes each of us, he creates each of us different. We have different personalities, right? We, we have different talents. We have different ways of thinking or working through things that are unique. And that is by God's design. And as believers, we're also given different gifts, different things that the Holy Spirit empowers us to do for serving Him. So not only are we created different in our DNA and all of that and how we approach life and personality, but then in following Jesus, He gives us different gifts and empowers us in that way. And Paul, and Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians. He says, now there are a variety of gifts, or there are many different gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different ways or varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are, there are different activities or variety of activities, but the same God who empowers them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Do you know what he's saying? These gifts that God gives to each of us, they differ, but they all complement each other. And these gifts are equally important. There's no gift that's higher than the others or makes somebody better or worse. They're, they're given not by our merit, but they're given by God's design for his work. And a final way that we're kind of different or unique is that God also gives us different opportunities. God places us in different areas. He gives us different families we grew up in and different families we have now. We live in different places, right? We have different jobs. We have different friends. We have different places where God takes us. And we also have different roles 
that God places before us at different times in proclaiming Jesus. Sometimes these differences are God uses us to plant seeds with people that then someone else will then build upon. Uh, sometimes God gives us um, th these planting seeds through our words or actions. Sometimes it's to illustrate his love so people can know his love. Some opportunities he gives us is to lead others to knowing Jesus or leading people to salvation. And other times it's to help others grow. And these roles are given at different times to different people. And sometimes we have these roles at different places area times of our lives in different situations why because it's all different because it's unique because the way in which we follow jesus and proclaim him or achieve his calling is unique the point is that we're all to follow and proclaim jesus but but we all do this differently at different times in different ways and in different places and, you know, as we look at our passage today, Peter and John are a perfect example of this. You know, sometimes we look at Peter and John and we say, well, they're disciples. They're all the same. Two people could not almost be more different to be on the inner circle of Jesus, right? Yet they were both followers of Jesus. They both were called and had the same calling and purpose. They were both apostles used to help establish the church. And they were both used greatly by God. But they were different. We look at Peter and throughout John's gospel, we see Peter. Peter's bold and he's impulsive in his actions, right? He's a doer. And um, sometimes he's, he's leaping before he looks, right? He's the first one that jumped out of the boat and walked on water. You know, he's the first one to uh, proclaim Jesus as the Christ, the son of the living God. So it's for good and bad sometimes. But this is, this is how he... He was put together, how God put him together. And he often spoke, spoke without thinking for the good and for the bad. And John was different. John was more measured in his life, wasn't he? He was more reserved in his responses and his actions. He would observe before acting. Just like even here, how he's following Jesus. He's not like getting in the conversation. Hey, what are you talking about, guys? He's just kind of following behind and, and waiting his turn to listen and to hear from Jesus. And their lives following Jesus were different, yet both made huge impacts in proclaiming Jesus. Peter, as he goes on from here, he's, he's the one who boldly proclaims Jesus wherever he goes. And he goes to others, and he lives life right in front of them. Um, getting down and personal with the sheep, just as Jesus had called them, right? And sometimes Peter made mistakes, and people saw him make these mistakes, and oftentimes they were very public, yet they also saw him be restored by Jesus over and over again. So they get to see him growing and get to grow alongside him. And Peter, this takes Peter all, way, all the way to his death, which is bold as well as he's crucified upside down in, to glorify Jesus and um, reflecting Jesus to the end, right? And John, his ministry was a little different. Um, he, he followed and he bore witness of Jesus in a different way. Yes, he did it with actions, and sometimes he even served alongside Peter in this, but even more so, John's big um, way that he accomplished God's call for him was through words of witness. We have his gospel for one, but we also see uh, um, in this passage how John does this, right? L look at verse 23. You know, Jesus says this, this saying about John that, that if, if, if I re let him remain until I come. And what happened was a lot of people heard about this and they misunderstood it. They saw it as a promise of, God, of Jesus that, that John wouldn't die before Jesus came back. And John, said, John sets the record straight, doesn't he? Why? He's a word of witness. He says, no, that's not what Jesus said at all. It wasn't as in a promise. It was as in a possibility. He's saying... If I were, if I chose to do this, what difference is to you? He, Jesus isn't making a promise here. See, he's making a possibility. And so John notes that in verse 23. And then he, he um, so he clearly corrects errors and things like that. And then he closes his gospel. He speaks to the veracity of the, of the uh, eyewitness account, right? He says, I've seen all of this with my own eye. This disciple, I'm bearing witness of these things. 
so that you know that the testimony is true, so that you know what I'm saying is reliable. And then he goes on to say, and he says, hey, listen, there's a lot more that could be said. And I could spend my whole life writing about it, but I said these things strategically to bear witness. Because this is how he's called me to fulfill my call. And later on, we see um, John, again, through his eyewitness accounts, and he, and he goes to the churches, and he leads the churches, but not in this upfront way, but more coming alongside people and helping them and bearing witness of Jesus and what he does. And then, you know what happened as he's old? Jesus decides to also reveal himself to, to John or reveal what his second coming will be like in Revelation. That's a revelation that Jesus gives him. So in a way, Jesus did have, Jesus, have John remain alive until, so he could see his return in that way. But see, then he gives John this so that John can report on it, give this eyewitness account of what is going to happen, what Jesus revealed to him. And then, he, and then John passes at an old age. He was one of the only disciples that wasn't martyred. Rather, he died of natural causes. So it's a much more quiet, much less bold in your face. But yet each of them achieved God's purpose, achieved their calling of following Jesus and proclaiming him. They couldn't have been much more different, could they? You see, and that's what we need to understand with our following Jesus. Just as these two men were both following and proclaiming Jesus, but doing it in their unique ways, that's what we can do as well. And what Jesus is getting at then when he tells Peter this, whether I do this with John or not, what business is over you? You follow me. He's getting personal. And he says, take your calling personally. Don't worry about how someone else is doing it. They may do it different than you. And what he's telling in this challenge for Peter is also a challenge for us as we follow him. And it's this. We should focus on what Jesus has for us not what he has for others. You understand that? What Jesus is saying here at the end of this, at the end of this gospel, of following him and being used mightily of him, is, you know what our top priority should be? Jesus, what do you have for me and how do I accomplish it? Rather than focusing on what others should be doing. You see, that can be very unproductive. Now, there are things that all of us should be doing. And, you know, it's, Jesus, by saying this, isn't saying we shouldn't care for other people. We shouldn't, you know, where there's obvious sin, we shouldn't be, you know, helping get them back with the Lord. He's not saying this. He's saying in serving and following God's call for your life. Our, for, our first priority is, Jesus, what have you called me to do? And how have you called me to do it? And what gets in the way of that is when we start to look at other people and we start to compare ourselves. And so this is so we should take the call of Jesus personally, just as he said to Peter, you follow me. And we should follow and proclaim Jesus and help others. And then we should help others make it personal as well. Help them understand how Jesus has made them so that they can do it in their unique way. I know as me as a, as a pastor, my job isn't, isn't to help make you be like me. You know what it is? It's to help you be like Jesus. It's not to do things the way I do things, but rather that you can seek God and learn to follow him personally. My goal as a father with my daughters is to help my kids learn and hear from me but to help them hear and respond to Jesus for themselves and follow where he leads them. Not how I think they should go or what they should do. I should be saying, seek God on this. You see, Becky, Becky's going off and she started student teaching. And that wasn't because I said, hey, you should go into teaching. It's because God told her that. And I want her to seek God on that. And that should be exciting for us when those around us are saying, man, God is leading me in this way. I want to go in this way. And and this is kind of what the writer of Hebrews 
is getting at in Hebrews chapter 10. And it's great um, where he t- talks about that we shouldn't um, neglect fellowshipping together. And in verse 24 of chapter 10, he says this, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Do you know what he's saying? How to stir up, how we can spur the leading of Jesus in each other's lives. And sometimes that means we get to serve together, and sometimes that means he leads people in our midst somewhere else to follow him, and that's okay if they're following Jesus. And that is what we want our call to be. And again, there are some common things that we should all hold together and be unified in. Acts 2 talks about them, right? As the church was unified. The church was unified in what? The teaching of God's word. We should be unified in the truth of God's word. And that we're looking at God's word as our our authority. And we should make sure that's always proclaimed in our lives. We should commit ourselves to prayer. And not only personal prayer, but corporate prayer. And we should commit ourselves to um, the gospel message. And proclaiming the gospel and to caring for each other. But from this, we should stir up in each other following Jesus according to his way, which isn't not necessarily always our way that we think, but Jesus will lead us. You know, several years ago, I never, I never thought God would take us to Arizona to follow him, but that was his way for us. And then when we were there, we never thought we'd leave. But as you follow God, he leads us and he directs us in how we should go. So as we spur each other on, well, how do we do this? Well, it varies. It looks different. Do you, do you know how we do it, though? The writer of Hebrews gets at it in, in, in verse 25. He says, not neglecting the meeting together as is in the habit of, hum, of some, but encouraging one another. One way that we do this is we get to know each other. We come alongside each other and we care for each other and we encourage each other and we watch each other grow in our relationship with God and we learn to cheer each other on rather than saying, you know, you shouldn't do that. We cheer each other on and say, what is God leading you to? Wow, that's exciting. And and we fellowship together and we grow together. But beyond that, it's going to vary from person to person how we encourage each other to follow God's leading. And it's going, to, it's going to vary from situation to situation. However, before we kind of wrap up this morning, I want to share with you that while we may encourage each other and why that may vary, there are some things, though, that we shouldn't do. And we shouldn't do when it comes to God creating us unique and giving us unique ways that we fulfill his calling. Because there's some ways that we can do damage with each other. For example, we should never compare. Do you know what I mean by that? Often we get discouraged when we look at at how God is using other people and we say, man, he's not using me. Why isn't he using me like that? And we start to compare ourselves with others. And maybe we start to get discouraged by that. And we start to say, well, God can't use me at all. And then all of a sudden, because we're comparing ourselves, we feel bad about ourselves. Or we compare ourselves with others and we say, wow, look, look at all the effects that God is having on my life and not having on theirs. I must, be do- I must be pretty great. And sometimes we can inflate ourselves because of it. And comparison is natural, but we want to make sure that God is directing that. I mean, it's hard, it's hard as a pastor and it's hard as a church by looking at friends of mine that are pastors and not compare what we're doing as churches. And sometimes it can make us down when God's using a church in a certain way and we don't see that, but also when we're doing things in a certain way and we're not doing that. And, and, and we, we get to see that and we get, to, we get to be encouraged by it rather than being discouraged or we start to say, well, it's either this or the other. And again, we can get discouraged ourselves when we compare. We can also inflate ourselves, and that's dangerous. So we shouldn't compare. Just because God's using you one way doesn't make it better than the way he's using somebody else. Or worse. We should also never compete. 
Do you ever get like that in following Jesus and the way God's using us to uniquely fulfill his call? And we get competitive over it. Sometimes we see this with John and Peter, that they get a little competitive. We have them racing to the tomb and things like that. And we, you know, some of the things that are happening with that. But, but this is when we, 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 we're trying to keep up with others, right? And what they're doing, because we see them as a threat to us following Jesus. Or we see them as saying, man, I need to do this because I won't be that. And I, I need to do it more than them because I need to sh- show them that, you know, I'm a better Christian. I've been saved longer or something like that. And, um, and when we, we, well, what happens when we get competitive? We start to focus on others more than we do God and his calling. And we can even, and because we get competitive, you know what happens? We can deceive ourselves. And we start to even lie about what God's do, doing, right? And, and trying to keep up appearances so that we're not falling behind other people. And we start to get competitive about that. Hey, sometimes God has us where we don't see him working in our life every second. And sometimes he's doing great things with the person. That doesn't mean you're not following him and you're not accomplishing his call. The Old Testament is filled with prophets who went years and years and years and years without seeing God achieve their calling through them. And yet they still kept going. And sometimes when we get competitive, we're tempted to just focus on performance. And we become very performance-driven rather than Jesus-driven in our life. And we say, I just got to keep up appearances now because other people are watching me and I need to keep, keep it up, keep ahead of people. And finally, we should never condemn. We should never condemn someone when they are following Jesus in a unique way that they're following Jesus or think that they're less. Now, again, if someone is in obvious sin, we should want them to repent and see God. But sometimes we do that with the way people follow Jesus and the way his calling is. It happens when we begin to look down on others for not doing things like we do them or doing the same things we're doing. Just because someone's following Jesus' call Differently doesn't make it necessarily wrong. What does this look like? Maybe God's called you to be involved in Seeds of Hope and the homeless ministry and go and do, do the homeless ministry and it's something God called. Be excited for that. But what happens sometimes, and I'm not saying it happens in this, it doesn't, but you come back and you're just like, the rest of this church, they're doing nothing. Man, we should have everybody there caring for the homeless. Well, God didn't call everyone to fulfill his call in that way. But he called you to it, so you should be doing it. But don't condemn other people for it. You know, oh, how can people not be up there singing? You know, why can't people sing or, or, or you know, preach on the street corner or do these things? And sometimes we look down on other people because they're not doing it the way we're doing it. Our, our question should be, are you following God's call for you and are you sure it's him? then how can I encourage you in that? That should be our response. Not to condemn someone just because they're not doing it the way we're doing it if God is leading them to do it that way. So we should never condemn in this. Again, by God's design and by his grace, he made us different. and, And he designed us to accomplish his will differently. So we complement each other. See, one of the reasons why God does that and does it in different ways is so that we can, as a church, do different things and do them well. Because some people he's given a call to to serve in Sunday school and, and, and proclaim Jesus and follow him by investing in kids. And some people to go to Seeds of Hope and some to help lead worship and some to lead a Bible study. And some to participate in in outreach. Now, we should all be involved in proclaiming Jesus. That's what we should share. But how we do it may vary. And we should help that. Because when we each do it according to how God has designed us and we're together, you know what happens? We reflect Jesus together in a more full way than we could ever do it just on our own. And that's why the church is important in this. So, again... As we close John, and we're talking about presenting Jesus, believing in Jesus, and then following Jesus. 
And in following Jesus and his call for us, we should focus on what Jesus has for us, not what he has for others. And we should take it personally to follow him. Let's pray.